Hello you beautiful misfits, my name is Matt and in this special episode of Pixel Burn we're going to delve into a story that happened earlier this April. It's a story I found tremendously fascinating, but it wasn't an easy one for most people to get into and most of the details are scattered all across the internet. So I thought I'd gather them all up, tie them together in a cohesive sequence and make the whole thing a tad less impenetrable for you all. So if you're sitting comfortably, because this will be a long one, then I'll begin. If you've ever watched the 2007 documentary King of Kong, A Fistful of Quarters, you'll need little to no introduction to one William James Mitchell Jr., better known to the world at large as plain old Billy Mitchell, hot sauce mogul, restaurateur, crap Peter Dinklage impersonator and world record setter for high scores in Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., Pac-Man, Ms. Pac-Man, Burger Time and Centipede, or rather, former world record holder, because as of April 12th this year, Billy Mitchell has officially been stripped of all his records and high scores by both Guinness World Records and American video game high score officiators Twin Galaxies after an investigation into one of his most famous scores confirmed long-held suspicions that he was a dirty rotten fibber. As such, Mitchell is now no longer considered the first to break 1 million points on Donkey Kong, nor is he now officially recognised as the first person to achieve a perfect score on Pac-Man even though it was played publicly on an original arcade cabinet in front of a live audience. Suspicions about the content of Mitchell's gaming morals have been doing the rounds since at least as far back as the original release of King of Kong, a portion of them stemming from his rivalry with one Roy Schilt, who recorded the world's first officially recognised highest score for Missile Command in 1983 under his preferred nom de jouer of Mr. Awesome. Without wanting to spoil the documentary too much for those who haven't seen it, because it's well worth watching and even more fascinating in light of these recent events. The score Mitchell eventually provides to Twin Galaxies to see off his would-be challenger, Steve Wiebe, was never recorded directly by the film crew. It was instead submitted to Twin Galaxies on a videotape with no independent witnesses to corroborate it. Which didn't stop Twin Galaxies accepting it without any questioning as a legitimate verified score, for reasons that assuredly had nothing whatsoever to do with the general hero worship of Mitchell among Twin Galaxies personnel, clearly on display in the documentary. The success of this was not just because someone got a perfect Pac-Man score, but because Billy Mitchell got a perfect Pac-Man score. Nor anything whatsoever to do with Mitchell's privileged position within the Twin Galaxies organisation at the time, as specified in this video by YouTuber Apollo Legend. Billy, he was actually supporting Twin Galaxies financially. I got several internal Twin Galaxies documents from Catherine Despira, and the first thing I noticed while reading them was Billy Mitchell's name all over them. Billy was at the very top of the food chain over at Twin Galaxies, so you can be sure he got preferential treatment when it came to verifying his scores. A privileged position only strengthened by Mitchell's close ties with Twin Galaxies founder Walter Day, a man who, by many accounts, is considered an all-round genuinely nice bloke, if somewhat eccentric and a touch too naive and trusting at times. Needless to say, grumbling and discontent were about as far as any suspicions against Mitchell could realistically go at the time. He was effectively considered the king of twin galaxies and therefore considered to be above the very rules he was suspected of breaking. That is until Walter Day retired from twin galaxies in 2010 to pursue a music career and presumably spend more time transcendentally meditating, whereupon Mitchell's influence on the organisation began to waver. After Walter Day's departure, the ownership of twin galaxies changed hands several times until 2014 when it was purchased by its current owner, Jace Hall, co-founder of developers Monolith, former CEO of esports organisation Echo Fox, former executive producer on the really quite good 2009 reboot of the classic sci-fi TV series V, and, perhaps his greatest achievement, the voice of the toaster in the Old World Blues expansion for Fallout New Vegas. A toaster is just a death ray with a smaller power supply! In the meantime, Mitchell's Donkey Kong scores had been usurped the traditional way by new challengers like Hank Chen, only to be reclaimed with this announcement at the Big Bang 2010 International Video Game Hall of Fame event in Ottawa, Iowa. Well, world, my friend Billy Mitchell has set a new world record on Donkey Kong Jr. and beaten the existing world record on Donkey Kong by exactly 1,100 points, and so now Billy Mitchell is once again the world record holder on both Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. This would be the last time Billy Mitchell officially held the world records for Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. We now fast forward to July of 2017 when Twin Galaxies implemented a new dispute system to, quote, maintain the integrity of the score database. This would allow any member of the Twin Galaxies community considered to be in good standing 
to dispute any score they suspected was a bit fishy. So needless to say, Billy Mitchell was almost immediately caught in the crosshairs of community scrutiny. Barely a month after the dispute system went live, Twin Galaxies member Jeremy Young went gunning for Mitchell's 2010 Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. scores. Mitchell's head wouldn't be the first to be claimed by this new system, however. You can't just rise up and depose a reigning monarch straight away without some sort of plan, or at least one hefty victory under your belt. It's like Omar says in HBO's The Wire. Hey yo, lesson here, babe. You come at the king, you best not miss. Around the same time Jeremy was going after Mitchell, a separate dispute was made against one Todd Rogers, a Twin Galaxies referee, for his record time on Dragster for the Atari 2600. Information and evidence provided by former Twin Galaxies senior referee Robert Mruczek, seen here in King of Kong, was instrumental in Twin Galaxies' final decision. On January 29th of this year, all of Todd Rogers' scores were removed, and he was banned from all further participation in the Twin Galaxies scoreboards. Meanwhile, the investigation into Mitchell's scores continued apace, and the amateur video game sleuths self-assigned to the case had plenty of material to work with. For starters, the footage shown at the Big Bang 2010 event, seen here on the monitors on the table. According to Mitchell himself, this footage had been captured via a direct feed from Original Machines at a family amusement centre in Florida called Boomer's Arcade six days prior. But people who are heavily into classic arcade games were quick to notice that the way the game's levels were being loaded on Mitchell's recordings was not the way an authentic Donkey Kong or Donkey Kong Jr. arcade machine would load them. Now this is where things start getting obscenely dry and technical, so I'll try and keep things as simple and jargon free for you all as possible. An original Donkey Kong arcade board loads levels like this, using what's called a sliding door effect. Older versions of the arcade emulator MAME, however, load levels in chunks like this. Jeremy Young illustrated this on the Twin Galaxies forums with judicious use of GIFs from various versions of MAME running Donkey Kong. Compared with GIFs of footage from an authentic Donkey Kong board, and GIFs from the gameplay footage shown at Mitchell's presentation. For your benefit and mine, I've taken some of these GIFs, slowed them down even further, and stitched them together in this crude side-by-side -side comparison. Now, consider for a moment that some of the people who watched Mitchell's presentation back in 2010 spotted this difference almost straight away, with the game running at normal speed. They wouldn't necessarily know it was from MAME, but they would know it wasn't from an original Donkey Kong arcade board. Another suspicious detail of Mitchell's 2010 record was a complete lack of any footage of him actually standing at a cabinet and getting his score. The only known recording of the attempt at Boomers, appropriately named the Boomers tape, is some badly overacted footage of a chap called Robert Childs swapping out a cabinet's Donkey Kong game board for a Donkey Kong Jr. one. You know that's what he's doing because he tells you. Hey, now the Donkey Kong record has been broken, taking the Donkey Kong board out of the game and putting the Donkey Kong Jr. board back in. Several times. Donkey Kong Jr. goes in. Quite emphatically. What we now have is Donkey Kong Jr. Thing is, if you know what to look for and you take a closer peek, you see the board he's removing from the machine is a Donkey Kong Jr. one to begin with. The board that's put in to replace it, meanwhile, is also a Donkey Kong Jr. board. You can tell it's a Donkey Kong Jr. board because it has distinctive banana yellow writing on it, whereas a Donkey Kong Sr. board has white writing. Donkey Kong the first also has four ROM chips compared to Donkey Kong Jr.'s three, as well as this doohickey for switching between digital and analog sound. This particular part is absent on the board for Donkey Kong Jr. because the game only had digital audio. If you're still with us after all that then congratulations, you now know more than you probably ever cared to about Donkey Kong arcade boards. Cabinet shenanigans aside, another point of suspicion was the distinct lack of witnesses to Mitchell's world record breaking feat. A little detail Mitchell was directly challenged about back in 2010, mere minutes after his announcement, by none other than Roy, Mr. Awesome Schilt. If you were going to do this in public, why didn't you make an announcement before you had even done it? Why didn't you make a public announcement about the time and location when you were going to do it? Well, there's the answer. <laughs> I guess when you have enough money, you can create whatever you want. People attempting these kinds of feats regularly do so at public events in front of an audience, on a machine known to be as close to the original hardware as physically possible. If they're attempting a record at home on the other hand, they'll usually have cameras and other recording devices set up in a way that puts them and the machine they're using under more scrutiny than a Chinese pro-democracy activist. 
Conversely, the only recording of Mitchell allegedly getting his record was the Boomer tape, and the only witnesses, besides Rob the Circuit Board magician here, were two Twin Galaxies referees. Well, if the referees were trustworthy and of good character, then would it matter if he didn't have a live audience of adoring fans cheering him on or a web of cameras surrounding him? The first referee was a member of the Twin Galaxies forums by the username of Morning Dove, a detail that is ultimately rather unremarkable. The real juicy bit is the second referee, Morning Dove's then boyfriend, who was none other than Todd Rogers. Yes, the very same Todd Rogers recently kicked off Twin Galaxies for faking his dragster record. One final little non-technical curiosity, noticed by writer and classic arcade game collector Catherine Despira, were the stacks of a special edition of Video Game Collector magazine available at the event. Mitchell's smug mug was emblazoned on the cover, while inside was a photo of him standing between two Donkey Kong arcade machines, accompanied with his supposed scores and the words New World Records plastered at the top of the page. Even though the scores hadn't yet been adjudicated by Twin Galaxies, and only six days had passed since he'd supposedly achieved them. Despira rightly points out that six days is a remarkably quick turnaround on an order to print an entire magazine, since most companies generally insist on at least two weeks' notice. Speaking anecdotally, as someone who used to have a job placing regular advertisements in a local county-wide newspaper, two weeks is the absolute bare minimum. Anything less than that would get you laughed at than the phone. Also, I assume, that never actually happened to me because I was good at my job. The likely explanation is that the magazine was printed well ahead of time, but that would be at least two weeks before Mitchell had supposedly attained his new records, almost three weeks before he announced them at Big Bang 2010. So how could they know what scores he'd gone and got if he hadn't gone and gotten them yet? By now, some of you are probably wondering why such a big deal over whether a game is played on an emulator or an original arcade cabinet. Donkey Kong's Donkey Kong, isn't it? Well, it depends on what you're playing it for. If you want some mostly accurate retro fun at home with some mates over a glass of wine or a few beers, and whatever, emulators are fine. If you're looking to set a world record on a classic arcade game, however, then... Actually, emulated versions on MAME are fine too. There are certain rules to abide by, like no auto-fire or custom BIOS settings, and they go on a separate section of Twin Galaxy's scoreboard for emulated games. Twin Galaxies will still accept them though. Submitting an emulated score and claiming it was done on an original arcade board, however, is grounds to throw the score out and ban the player from the leaderboards. And Mitchell was adamant that he had not used MAME. I've never even played MAME. I don't have MAME loaded in my home. While emulators have come a long way over the years, particularly for arcade games, there are still issues involved with using them in the context of setting world records. The obvious one is outright cheating, such as restoring a botched run to an earlier save state and continuing from there. But there are other less dubious reasons too. Variations in PC hardware might cause the game to lag where it shouldn't, or change the timing on some hazards ever so slightly, and generally causing a lack of consistency between different runs on different hardware. None of these issues occur with original arcade boards. Some tiny, Almost imperceptible variations can and do occur between different machines for any number of trivial reasons. A stray spot of glue on a certain transistor, a bent cable, or the ambient temperature of the venue, for example. It's generally accepted, however, that everyone playing on the same kind of machine with original hardware does so on an even playing field, leaving individual player skill as the primary factor in determining who is the best. In short, the accusation wasn't specifically that Mitchell had been playing the game on main, because Twin Galaxies allows for that. It was that he'd lied about it and then tried to pass off his emulated scores as original arcade hardware ones. And Twin Galaxy's rules on this are abundantly clear. The rules for submitting scores for the original arcade Donkey Kong competitive leaderboards require the use of original arcade hardware only. The use of MAME or any other emulation software for submission to these leaderboards is strictly forbidden. Before any action could be taken with regards to these accusations, they first had to be investigated. Jeremy Young's own dispute filing, backed up with the evidence he'd already gathered, formed the basis for Twin Galaxy's own investigation. Numerous experts, hobbyists and casual observers also contributed. Billy Mitchell himself, meanwhile, hired the services of one Carlos Pinheiro to investigate the allegations on his behalf and, so Mitchell probably hoped, exonerate him. Now, I won't hit you with every single detail of these investigations, but it was a very long, very involved, drawn-out process over several months, covering much of which I've already explained, and frankly, a lot of the technical details go right over my head. I can still give you a couple of highlights, though. When the exact direct feed capture setup Mitchell claimed to have used to record his scores was tested, 
it was found to only capture black and white footage with no audio. Analysis of the audio from Mitchell's original recordings provided by Twin Galaxies found various gaps and sound anomalies. Since a direct feed from a cabinet wouldn't produce these gaps or anomalies, it was deemed to be evidence of several MAME-sourced video clips being stitched together. Another thing was... Um... Okay, I think I've reached the limit of non-techie highlights I can give you here. Long story short, Twin Galaxies found Billy Mitchell to be a big fibbing rotter. Ironically, Twin Galaxies couldn't deliver a definite verdict concerning the original score being disputed, the so-called Boomer score, shown off at Big Bang 2010. In Twin Galaxies' own words, the 1,062,800 Donkey Kong performance does not have enough of a body of direct evidence for Twin Galaxies to feel comfortable to make a definitive determination on at this time. They were, however, able to conclude that a tape of another of Mitchell's claimed high scores, called the Mortgage Broker's score, was not captured directly from an original machine. But they couldn't confirm that it was specifically recorded using MAME either. Testing every other emulator out there to find the specific one Mitchell might have used would take the amount of time and resources you'd only really feel justified in using to catch serial killers, or to track down a terrorist cell. Still, the simple fact that the footage wasn't from an original arcade board was enough to satisfy Twin Galaxies that their rules had been broken. Perhaps the most delicious result of Twin Galaxies' investigation, however, came from their analysis of the original King of Kong tape. Yep, the very same one Mitchell uses in the film to crush Steve Weeby's hopes and dreams of being the first to break 1 million points on Donkey Kong. Upon re-examining Mitchell's footage, Twin Galaxies concluded that, like the Mortgage Brokers recording, it was not produced by the direct feed output of an original, unmodified Donkey Kong arcade PCB. You'll remember, of course, that Mitchell had engaged a third party, Carlos Pinheiro, to investigate the case claims on his behalf. There are two sides to every story, after all, and just because his services had been engaged by Mitchell didn't necessarily mean he tried to muddy the waters or derail the investigation somehow. At least, I hope Mitchell wasn't expecting him to, because Carlos pretty much came to the same conclusion as Twin Galaxies. In fact, the more eagle-eyed among you probably noticed earlier, Carlos himself tested the capture setup Mitchell claimed to have used. On April 12th, 2018, all of Billy Mitchell's scores were removed from Twin Galaxies' competitive leaderboards, and he has been banned from participating in them for the foreseeable future. The very next day, Guinness World Records, with whom Twin Galaxies are officially partnered, divested Mitchell of all his world records. These include the first perfect score on Pac-Man, highest score on Pac-Man, and the first person to break 1 million points on Donkey Kong. That last one now belongs officially, in every sense of the word, to one Mr. Steve Wiebe. A victory and vindication 11 years in the making for the man who challenged the King of Kong. Whew, talk about playing the long game, eh? Here's to you, Steve. Weeby was understandably quite chuffed to bits by the news and had the following to say in an interview with Variety magazine. I'm not the champ anymore, but getting recognition for being the first to a million is a great consolation. That's what I was really bummed out about 11 years ago. Billy will have his turn to say something in response. For now, I'm just in awe. Three days after Twin Galaxies' announcement, Billy Mitchell did indeed have his say by way of the following statement recorded by Old School Gamer magazine. Billy Mitchell is on the advisory board for Old School Gamer magazine. Hi, I'm Billy Mitchell. We're here at the Midwest Gaming Classic. I'm here with Old School Gamer magazine. I've been asked to address things that are recently in the media. The fact of the matter is, now there is a true professional due diligence being done to investigate things that happened as far as 35 years ago in a professional manner not in a shock jock mentality designed to create hits. We will show that everything that has been done, everything was done professionally, according to the rules, according to the scoreboard, the integrity that was set up, not 2014 forward by the current regime who wants to reach back 35 years. Everything will be transparent, everything will be available. I wish I had it in my hands right now. I wish I could hand it to you but it's taken a considerable amount of time. Witnesses, documents, everything will be made available to you. Nothing will be withheld. You absolutely have my commitment to that. We've been at this since 1982, and it's not gonna stop now. That's all well and good, Billy, me old mucker, but Twin Galaxies investigation went on for about eight months. You probably should have submitted all this magical exonerating evidence before you got stripped of all your scores and records. 
As for your comments about going back 35 years, if that's what Twin Galaxies choose to do, then that's their prerogative. In fact, that kind of talk only makes me even more suspicious. Do you know something we don't, Billy? How many more scores aren't entirely on the level? Personally, if I had a globally recognised high score on Twin Galaxies, I'd want every measure taken to validate suspicious entries and no stone left unturned. Any score that is less than legitimate casts a shadow over every other one, so it's important for Twin Galaxies to be seen doing this and be unafraid to investigate previous records, however old those records might be. It's the very least one should expect from an organisation that prides itself on the integrity of its leaderboard. However, I am not entirely devoid of sympathy for Billy Mitchell. I'm not saying I consider him a victim here or that he's been unfairly maligned, hell no. All I'm saying is if I rummaged in my pocket long enough, deep enough, I might find a smidgen of pity for him. Somewhere amongst all the lint and loose change. Enough to make me feel a tad mercifully inclined towards letting him keep his perfect Pac-Man score, his publicly witnessed Donkey Kong high score of 933,900 from 2004, and his claim of being the first to reach level 256 in Pac-Man. These were achievements he gained legitimately after all, so far as anybody can measure. Exposing his devious shenanigans and vindicating Steve Wiebe are enough to satisfy me, although your mileage may vary. On the other hand, there is a satisfying sense of karmic retribution at seeing a man so desperate to keep what victories, records and titles he had left that he wound up losing all of them, even the legitimate ones. Besides, as Billy's mate Stephen Sanders says approximately 20 minutes into King of Kong, how do you declare a champion unless there are rules and if you break them you lose? To some gamers, young and not so young alike, this quibbling over something as quaint and old fashioned as a high score may seem exactly that quaint and old-fashioned. Why play only for ephemeral points and niche prestige like that kid in The Wizard when there are more tangible benefits to be gained with pro gaming skills? Like tournament cash prizes, lucrative sponsorship deals, twitch bucks and mad merchandise woolong. One very obvious reason is that Donkey Kong and other classic arcade games are an indelible part of gaming history. And who are you who does not know their history? It may sound like a cliche, but without the likes of Donkey Kong, Missile Command, Gallagher, Defender and others, we literally wouldn't have the player fort knowns Battle Knights or Calls of Honor modern gubbins we enjoy today. Another reason is even if you don't particularly care about the Twin Galaxies leaderboards, the people who maintain, support and contribute to them clearly do. And I'm not going to piss all over their efforts in some edgy attempt to appear cooler than thou. All power to them for living their dharma particularly as these so-called old games are still throwing up new secrets and surprises, not to mention still genuinely challenging people decades after their original release. What ultimately drew me to this story, however, is if you strip away all the talk about ROM chips, sound switches, MAME transitions and other technical stuff, you're still left with a classic story of greed, manipulation, deception, suffering, judgement and good versus evil, all rooted in that timeless universal human fear of being forgotten. Not bad for a 37 year old arcade game about a man fighting a giant monkey on a building site. Speaking of which, on Friday the 2nd of February this year, a new world Donkey Kong arcade high score record of 1,247,700 points was set by a chap called Robbie Lakeman. After 3 hours and 49 minutes of gameplay streamed on Twitch, the cabinet he'd been using was disassembled and its components examined for all to see to vouch for the new record's authenticity. All this was deemed satisfactory enough evidence for the Twin Galaxies arbitration and submission process to enter Lakeman's score into the top spot of their Donkey Kong leaderboards, where it currently remains. Undisputed. That's all for this single topic episode of Pixel Burn. If you liked it, then please do let me know by clicking the requisite button down below and letting your friends, family and Billy Mitchell know as well. You might also consider clicking the subscribe button while you're at it and maybe even that obnoxious little bell. You shouldn't have to click that last one, but I'd be very grateful if you did. If you really, 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 really like my stuff, perhaps consider contributing to my Patreon. Each and every pledge helps the channel become bigger, better and more regular and makes you an even more beautiful misfit than you already are. At the very least, I hope you found this video tolerable. Meanwhile, until next time, as always, there's a Donkey Kong kill screen coming up if anybody wants to watch.